Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. Lawmakers consider solutions for struggling home-based child care providers to prevent gun violence and to bring fresh produce to schools, plus the objectives of the United Black Legislative Caucus. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. In-home child care providers are closing their doors at a staggering rate. The Senate Family Care and Aging Committee began looking into solutions to reverse the trend. In September of 2018, we officially, officially fell below 8,000 licensed family child care for providers down to 7,955. As of yesterday, we have lost another, another 125 child care providers in only 24 weeks. We are now down to 7,870 licensed family child care providers. This is still on average of one to two licensed providers who are closing their doors daily. Proving these reforms are desperately needed. We're being challenged, I think appropriately, to create more mechanisms and avenues for providers to engage. My frustration is the licensors at some point re report to you. And so there's a theme that Safety is everything, and I, God bless safety. But there's some things that are just not any real safety issues. They become a matter of some jot or a tittle on a piece of paper. We have been trying to work more closely with the counties and beginning to create some structures to more engage them. When we're blaming it all on the county licensors, it's coming from above. And don't, don't get me wrong, we do have some licensors in some areas that have problems and have gone way overboard. But DHS is also aware of that, and their comments have been that while they're not a state employee, there isn't anything they can do, that we can do. Measures to address the lack of affordable child care across the state are moving in the Senate. Joining me to talk more about that is Senator Bill Weber. Welcome. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. You held listening sessions all around the state during the interim. What did you hear from people? Well, we heard a great frustration, quite frankly, on the part of our providers. Uh, in rural Minnesota, we have a very large percentage of our daycare is provided through the in-home daycare process. In fact, in my home county, uh, there are no centers per se. It is all provided by in-home daycare providers, and that's true in a lot of rural areas. And right now, there's an extreme frustration on their part uh, with, the, uh, with the problems that they're encountering and being able to deliver the service. They feel that DHS has went way too far in terms of their rules and regulations and they actually spend more time worrying about paper reports and everything else than, than they feel they and it takes time from what they feel they should be giving to the children. Well and you have a bill on this very issue it was in committee last week I believe it's laid on the table that would sort of make it easier to dispute issues between a provider and between the Department of Human Services. Do I have that right? Well, that is correct. Actually, it's, it, what happens is, remember, in, in, there's two ways that daycare is, is uh, actually, I'll say, uh, run or governed by the state of Minnesota. In the case of in-home daycare providers, our counties actually do the licensing and provide the inspections. In the case of centers, it is the state itself that does that. But of course, at the county level, when they're dealing with in-home providers, uh, all the rules are actually given to the counties by DHS. And so what we wind up with sometimes are questions of interpretation. What does this rule actually mean? How far does it actually go? And we wind up with some inconsistency out there as to how things uh, are enforced and to what kind of, of uh, infractions are written up, for example, uh, by the inspectors on the daycare providers. And so there's been some frustration that there, there's been a desire, number one, to have uh, sort of a, an anonymous call-in number to the state where someone could get actually uh, some information to clarify, and this is by the provider. But it also has, um, there's been some instances where uh, it's sort of like, uh, okay, we called in, this is what we were told. Oh, no, that's not what you were told. And so, and there's differences even amongst the different state people. And so what they're saying is, when we call in to get this clarification, we, we wish to have it made in writing so that we have proof of what we were told and that they can then appeal any type of uh, uh, 
potential infraction that's been found by on the part of the county. So the in-home providers are struggling with some bureaucratic issues. They are. Is that the only issue that the small in-home, because there, where there's two sides, and I want to talk about the other, but that the, the in-home providers are really struggling with is, is it mostly bureaucratic or is there more that they need? Well, there's also the situation of the dollars and cents. So what happens a lot of times is that the, is that the um, uh, ability to charge rates that make it a viable business uh, are difficult to obtain in many of our rural areas, depending upon what <clears throat> what jobs uh, are available in that particular area. Um, you know, and, and also, um, as they look at the, all the rules and regulations, number one, that's higher, it produces higher cost to them. And then if you look at some of those rules and regulations from a dollar and cent standpoint, uh, if you were an in-home daycare provider, if you met all the different age classifications that you can have, you could have up to a maximum of 12 children. If you have a full-time staff person, you can have 14. Well, how are you going to pay for a full-time staff person with 14? Uh, and so there's, there's the rules out there actually do counteract the, the or, and make more difficult the financial success of our daycare providers as well. Now, and, and the same holds true into the centers, even in the rural areas. You look at the case mix or the, the age mix that you can have uh, within, your, within your center, and, uh, and it becomes a real issue uh, because obviously you have a smaller number of infants and toddlers, mm -hmm. but those are the groups that require the most effort uh, to take care of. So what do people need? Do they need incentives? Do they need the standards, the age ranges to change? What would really help these in-home daycare providers make enough money and be able to stay open? Number one, I think that we need to get a handle on the rules and regulations. Quite frankly, many of them are in this business because they love children. And, and they want to, yes, be able to, to make a living at it or add to the family's living because of it. Because you don't just dedicate yourself if you're an in-home daycare provider. You dedicate your family, you dedicate your home, uh, all these type of things. And, uh, and so they really need uh, to have some relief on that end. And then at the end of the day, yes, whatever we can do, uh, sometimes it's the, the CCAP funding, which has fallen way off track in terms of inflation, the CCAP is the money that that uh, the state pays for child care assistance to those okay. that qualify. Okay. Uh, you know, there there are some changes that we could make there too that would make life easier for them. One final quick question: The Department of Human Services did announce last month that they're going to have 1.5 million dollars go to regional development and philanthropic organizations around the state to help tackle. This is directed towards centers. Is that a step in the right direction? Well, I think it's helpful. I think, number one, we always need to see what kind of, uh, of uh, rules are attached to the availability of those funds. Uh, but I think that certainly uh, it, it would be helpful. I know that in my home community, there was an effort made to look at a center. And depending upon whether they were going to remodel an existing structure or build a new structure, uh, for we were, we were considered to have uh, 111 uh, spots that were short, that we needed 111 spots for daycare. And so if you built a center to cover that through one of those two options, we would either have an a operating loss of 160000 or 350000 for the year, depending upon which option you went. So at that point, you have no options. So the money will be useful. Senator Weber, I'm sure, I'm looking forward to hearing more on this. Thank you so much. Thank you. In the last election, three additional African Americans were elected to the House, making an historic total of six black lawmakers serving at the Capitol. At a recent press conference, they announced the United Black Legislative Caucus. Our black communities face some particular challenges, and we're hopeful that working collectively as a caucus, that we can better address these issues. We have significant disparities when it comes to education, and Minnesotans expect us to end this opportunity gap, delivering all students, including black students, to give them the tools they need to achieve. We are going to be a force to be reckoned with. We are gonna work with the other uh, councils. We're going to work with the other caucuses uh, to make sure that the voices of uh, underrepresented people at the Capitol are heard. Um, but we are going to do this 
uh, in a way that I think is going to be visible. And I think and I would hope uh, that this is a message to Minnesotans to be helpful and this is a message to our colleagues that they should beware that we are going to put forth a series of proposals that are going to be good for Minnesotans. And as I like to say, if it's good for African and African American people, it's good for the state. The struggles of racial disparities put a question mark in our progress as a state. The root cause of historical injustice and exclusion is something that we have to tackle as a state. From wealth inequalities, the achievement gap, home ownership, lack of jobs and opportunity is something that we have to address in this house and be able to serve all communities. The parents of Taylor Hayden, sister to Senator Jeff Hayden, recently testified before a key Senate committee in favor of a program to help prevent gun violence. I've worked 40, after my recovery, 46 years of sobriety from drugs and alcohol, I have worked 43 years to help other people's children not to do or be what my daughter ended up being. I worked hard, but I also did not work to, in vain. You know, in other words, I wasn't gone all the time, you know, uh, to, to work with others, and then my baby turns out to be something. She was like in Edina when she got killed. She wasn't in the bucket of blood. She wasn't in a seedy place. She had done all the right things. And then a policeman knocks on my door and lets me know to call somebody to tell me that my baby was killed at a supper club, she and her girlfriends and things of this nature. And so, so excuse my emotions, but I just want you to know you never, you don't want your best, your worst enemy to go through what we have that so many other people are going through. We want to get upstream on this and we want to do some preventive measures. We want to do some educational measures. We want people to understand that gun violence doesn't have to be the way it is today. We want people to understand that there are other ways of settling differences versus pulling out a gun. We want people to understand that people's lives are more than the moment, more than I want what you have, and if I can't take it from you, I'm going to shoot you, kill you, and take something. Now joining me in the studio to talk about the Taylor Hayden Gun Violence Prevention Act, as well as the newly formed United Black Legislative Caucus, is Senator Jeff Hayden. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Your sister Taylor was killed, caught in the crossfire of a gang-related incident in mm -hmm. 2016. Shortly thereafter, you promoted the idea of the Taylor Hayden Gun mm -hmm. Violence Prevention Act mm -hmm. in her memory. If, and, it's, and there was a hearing last week That's in the right. Senate. If this becomes law, what will it do? Well, here's what it would do. It would give dollars, appropriate dollars, to the Department of Health, who's already working on broader violence issues as a public health issue. They would then have an RFP out in the community and solicit bids from community organizations that specialize in working with young people primarily, and especially in the urban areas, to prevent violence, and in particular, gun violence. So it would kind of work like some organization would come and say, listen, here's our curriculum, we're working in schools, we're working in park and rec centers, uh, we're working in community organizations, and they would go and talk to folks and say, here's what happens if you use a gun to settle your dispute, or here's what happens to you and here's what happens to the families, and hopefully that gives an opportunity to get young folks to change their mind. Um, there are just a tremendous amount of shootings and a tremendous amount of violence that are going on in our communities. That's a little different from the conversation we're having about gun safety and I support those as well this isn't about the kind of Second Amendment taking guns away this is about the underlying behavior um, that happened my sister was just on vacation was coming out of a restaurant this violence erupted and someone used her as a human shield she had nothing to do with anything she grew up in Minnesota she was a college graduate she was working at a corporation and she just simply was at a place in which this violence erupted and so then this would help young Minnesotans mm -hmm. understand that the answer 
to any problem is not grabbing a gun, it's something else. Absolutely. Um, along with my sister, uh, well, well over 20 years ago, my best friend was also killed with gun violence. The person who actually murdered him was caught and is now sitting in jail as a quote unquote model prisoner and tells everybody that if he had that if he had that to do over, he had those 10, seven seconds to do over, he would, and now he's spending from 19 all the way into probably his mid 40s if he ever gets out um, because of that murder. So, so we know that even those that have committed this violence wish they hadn't, and so we're hoping to get upstream with that so that they don't do that. Well, let's turn now to the United Black Legislative Caucus. In the last election, the number of black lawmakers doubled mm -hmm. um, from three to six in the House. Uh, Representative Muhammad Noor, Hodan Hassan, and Ruth Richardson. With mm -hmm. these historic numbers, you formed the United Black Legislative Caucus. Mm -hmm. What are the goals of your caucus? Well, the first thing we wanted to do was to get together and talk about the issues that we uh, think are most present in Minnesota. So you hear a lot about the disparities, education disparities, you know, economic uh, outcomes that aren't good for African Americans, poverty index that is up, incarceration rates are up, criminal justice reform. So we wanted to be able to figure out how can we come together, come with a concrete piece of uh, a platform, if you will, to say how we're going to deal with this. In addition to that, we wanted to talk to a lot of people just like us that are actually doing well in Minnesota. And we want to send a really strong message out to them, people in the corporate communities, nonprofits, teachers, and others, that they can use this caucus in order to bring the great ideas to promote economic prosperity, uh, to be role models in our community, as well as start to uh, uh, figure out how to deal with and close these gaps. The one thing that's really clear to me over the last 11 years that I was here is that no matter what we do, if we do it without people of color, because we're also char part of the larger people of color indigenous caucus, and we believe that the more time, the more people of color that are in governance positions, that are in leadership positions, that not only are competent but bring their life experiences, places like the University of Minnesota Regent conversation we're having, uh, local government, county government, and here at the state, the more we have those voices at the decision-making level or at the level that we're at, the better off that we are going to be at closing these inequities. Well, and one interesting thing about your caucus is that it represents both people born and raised in Minnesota, mm -hmm. but also people who were immigrants or refugees coming to mm -hmm. Minnesota. How does that factor in? Well, um, we all are, came from Africa originally at some point. Either uh, my ancestors were brought here on slave ships or my good friend, um, Mohammed Noor and Hodan Hassan, who is a rep in my district, uh, came here fleeing a much better life uh, from a failed state in Somalia, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have this kind of you know, origins that that's where we come from. We also have the same issues that we're facing. And though I am kind of a born and raised Minnesotan to some ex uh, extent, and I have that viewpoint, they bring the uh, refugee and immigrant uh, perspective to that. We think that putting those two together and then thus bringing those two communities together, then that's this comment about being a force to be reckoned with. Now we have the political power, now we have the community power, we have the solutions in our hands, and then we can impact uh, the folks that we need to influence to be able to change some of the, the, the policies that we think are impeding our growth and actually closes the gap. Senator Hayden, thank you so much. Thank you. At a recent press conference, lawmakers introduced a bill that would expand early learning scholarships for low-income families. As chair of the committee that is laser focused on closing achievement gaps and innovation, I am more convinced than ever that early learning scholarships need to be, they must be, a top priority. These important scholarships help low-income kids be ready for kindergarten, be um, less likely to need special education, be proficient in reading by third grade, which is critical, more likely to complete high school, and be college or career ready, and, and so much more. My Mateo used to go just two days at the beginning of the school. I did the struggle at the beginning, but I asked for help with Joyce Briscoe, and I said, how can my Mateo come a full time in class? And they offered me the scholarship and I apply, and I'm so 
thankful that I approve. Why? Because my Mateo, I can see him smile every day, wake up in the morning and say, Mommy, it's time to go to school. And I say, yes, my dear. When we received an early learning scholarship for Colin, it was a critical lifeline for our family. With the scholarship, I'm able to bring him to a New Horizon Academy that has a four-star parent-aware rating. There I know he is learning from proven curriculum and being cared for by wonderful people, setting him up for success in kindergarten and beyond. And a few days later, a proposal for the creation of a rare disease advisory council. One in 10 Americans have a rare disease, resulting in 30 million people having a serious, lifelong condition, and more than half of those with a rare disease are children. The goal of creating this advisory council on rare diseases is to gather experts from across medical fields and have them come together and use their knowledge and expertise to provide advice, research, diagnosis, and treatments related to rare diseases. The journey usually begins for a family with a rare disease um, with no initial indication that a child or a person has any medical issues. My own daughter was born happy and healthy. Nothing was indicated at her birth that she had any problems. But after the symptoms appear, a rare patient waits on average seven to eight years to receive a diagnosis. Um, that can be much longer. One rare mother I know waited for six years for her son to be diagnosed. He passed away at seven. The vast majority of her life with her son was spent frantically looking for an answer to what was wrong with her child. The creation of the council <laughs> will create more opportunities for rare disease to be understood throughout many different industries, and that will help children be able to grow into young adults that can then advocate for themselves like I can now. And as a rare disease patient, although we all have different diagnoses, we all face very similar issues within insurance or health care. And because of this, one council that covers all rare disease as a general topic will help so many more patients and it will make us not as rare as we seem. The locavore movement may be coming to a school or daycare center near you. The legislature will consider a bipartisan measure that would facilitate relationships between farmers and school lunch programs. And the sponsor of the Senate bill, Senator Mike Goggin, joins me to talk more about it. Welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So explain the farm to school program. Well, actually, it's quite simple. It uh, allocates $2 million a year uh, for our local farmers to work with our local schools, our child care centers, uh, our home day care centers to provide uh, fresh fruits and vegetables to our, our young children. Is it remarkable to you that Minnesota is only one of 12 states that do not have this policy in place, considering that we are an agricultural state? Very surprising. Uh, you know, uh, when my kids were young and we had them at home daycare, uh, Cindy was really good about introducing new fruits and vegetables every week. Uh, they'd get a new fruit and vegetable to try. And my kids are now 25 and going to be 22 on Sunday, and they still, when they go to eat or whatever, they're, buying, they're getting salads, fruits, vegetables. So getting these fruits and vegetables introduced to the kids as early as possible to encourage healthy eating habits, uh, that's what it's all about. Well, and it's not just fruits and vegetables, but it's also meat products, honey, mm -hmm. beans, all of the things that can grow on our farms here in Minnesota. What are farmers saying about this? Well, actually this morning I was going through my emails and I'm getting a lot of uh, really positive emails from local farmers saying, you know, thank you so much for doing this. This is a really a good win-win situation for the schools, the ch uh, children, uh, the local economy, and the f local farmers. It just gives them that much more opportunity to, to get their uh, produce and, and goods to uh, our kids in our schools and help them uh, have a good nutritious meal. And, uh, you know, our kids in school are going to have a, a lot better attention in classrooms than that. Uh, and as early as we can possibly get this food introduced to the kids uh, you know we need to get their bodies uh, wanting to eat healthy as early as we possibly can. Now the bill would allocate two million dollars a year I know 150,000 of that is for a coordinator to mm -hmm. coordinate these programs what is the rest of the money spent on? Well that's where the uh, the schools the child care providers will uh, put in for grants for the for money to get that uh, to get reimbursed for what they spend uh, doing that. 
and they have to work with local farmers that are uh, part of the program. Will there be some education then for the people who are preparing this food, ideas how to prepare it? Because, you know, we know how to, we all know how to open a can or make a box of mac and cheese or something, but how do you make a kohlrabi? What's going to be the best <laughs> use of honey? Is there education for that? Uh, we, we intend to have some education as part of that coordinator's position will be education uh, materials and that and opportunities for the schools and the child care centers and the, and the home daycare operators uh, to, to get recipes on how to, how to work with that, uh, those different types of food. Now, when so. I was growing up, a family farm did uh, produce a lot of different products. There was a lot of variety, but farming these days is much more specialized. I mean, generally, bigger operations just one crop. This requires a diversity. Is there a new kind of farmer out there? Yeah, I kind of equate these new farmers to like the microbrewery breweries out there. Uh, these folks are coming in, they're, they're uh, doing small operations and they're very specialized and focused in what they're growing and uh, uh, this just gives us another opportunity for uh, uh, the farming community to, to grow and expand and, and uh, you know hopefully it'll go the way the microbrewery has gone. Uh, according to a press release from the National Farm to School Network, every dollar invested in a farm to school program generates $2.16 for the local economy. How does this effort actually help the local economy? Well, you've got uh, the farmers are able to sell their goods and services to, to the schools and the, and the daycare centers, and that just adds more to the economy as, as that money gets put into the, into the economy locally. And we keep it local. We buy local, we, we supply local, and it just helps generate that uh, revolving economy with that. This reminds me of the, the phrase, what's old becomes new again. Uh, our grandparents cooked this way, ate this way, and then we've kind of moved away. Is this an effort really to move back towards that more wholesome, whole-grown way of eating? Yes, it is, and, and people are, are requesting that. They're, they're wanting to go back to that, so this fits really nicely into uh, people's uh, wanting to go back to that type of food and that type of meal preparation. Um, you know, it, it's just uh, people want to eat healthier, and so again, Watching my kids grow up, I want to see kids have the opportunity to, to build good, healthy eating habits at an early age. As they get older, it's going to help us as far as uh, health care costs and, and, and that. Uh, people are going to hopefully start out with a really healthy lifestyle to begin with and keep that moving throughout their life. Now, outside of the cost for this measure, are there anyone, are there any groups, any people, any industries that are objecting to this? I haven't had one person object to this. Uh, no emails, no Facebook posts or anything like that. Uh, it's been very, very positive and, and I think this is the opportune time to, to make this happen and, and do this for our, for our kids to, to start building healthy lifestyle eating habits and for our local farmers and our local economies. Senator Goggin, thank you so much. You're welcome, thank you. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.